we thought it was uh, a place where people lived, you know, a domestic place, and we thought the posts were the posts of great buildings. And that was because they had woven walls and they had floors and we found bits of pottery and bits of animal bone that we thought the remains of meals. Um, and then we had the timbers of the posts very accurately dated by tree ring dating. And to our amazement, the house, as we thought it was, was occupied for 400 years. Well, I'm sorry, but in the middle of a fen, a wooden house wouldn't last 400 years. I mean, you'd be lucky if it lasted four months, I'd have thought. Since 1982, some 17,000 pieces of Bronze Age wood have been unearthed, perfectly preserved in the waterlogged fen. Well, you've got posts. Um, now, these are just a, a few of perhaps several hundred thousand posts that ran across Flag Fen in a dead straight line in rows. And we think the wettest part of the site, which is where we are now, um, they've consolidated the surface by laying in Again, hundreds of thousands of pieces of wood, like spillikins, or one on top of another like that. Um, the platform, as we call it, around the post, cover two and a half acres. It, it's absolutely huge, and we can't think of any reason why you should build a timber platform two and a half acres, because they weren't actually living on it, we don't think. The excavation and analysis of the thousands of pieces of wood have allowed a model to be constructed, showing how the platform was raised in the marsh and connected between the mainland and an offshore island by the massive alignment of oak posts. But if people didn't live on it, why build this strange monument in such a wet place? People in the late Bronze Age loved water and they did all sorts of strange things in and around water. And one of the strangest things they've done is here. In amongst the timbers, they dropped, very carefully dropped, they didn't just sling them in. Swords, daggers, spearheads, beautiful bronze objects, even gold objects, little gold ring and so on. And they were going up to the very edge and, and, and carefully offering these incredibly valuable things. Um, for example, down there, we've got three stones. Now, Stones don't immediately make you jump up and down, but there aren't any stones in Peterborough. And those stones probably come from Derbyshire. They're unused millstones, and I mean, they must have been worth a fortune. I mean, the equivalent today would be buying a brand new deep breeze, not putting anything in it, not even bothering to put a plug on it, and sticking it in the fen. But what was so significant about water to these people? Evidence from other parts of the country shows that, as ever in Britain, the weather was to blame. At Queen's University in Belfast, evidence from tree rings shows dramatically just how wet the climate was getting in the Bronze Age. We have been very conscious of the fact that trees must record past environmental uh, information. The tree rings show at this time a reduction from fairly wide rings to extremely narrow rings. You've got 20 years of growth compressed into approximately one centimetre at this point so that the trees have closed right down. They are producing no summer wood. Why did that happen? Well, the implication is that it happened because in this situation of increased rainfall, the water table in the bogs rose, covered the roots of the trees, and when you do that to a tree, it effectively ceases to grow. These trees were put in a situation where they were just hanging on to life for something like two decades. And I think we have to imagine a whole succession of, of wet years, failed harvests, um, possible dislocation of, of populations, people abandoning the uplands, all of those sorts of, of parameters might be called into, into play by a ca catastrophic event of this type. And in the soils of Scotland, a team working on a site at Lairg, to the north of Inverness, have uncovered tangible evidence of this. Once this place was farmland, with barley growing in the fields, but today it's windswept and desolate. Given that the quality of their lives up here was already pretty marginal, I think we can assume that they wouldn't have much in the way of um, stored resources to carry them through a catastrophic failure of crops or a succession of crop failures. And it's clear from the monuments that the final abandonment is abrupt and widespread. It must clearly have been a time of tremendous social stress because the deluges of impoverished people pouring down from the hillsides 
and facing pressure on lowland settlement must have created a tremendous uh, degree of friction. And back in Ulster, at Navan in County Armagh, Richard Warner showed me a site where that stress seemed to be expressed by religious activities to which water was so central they dug out their own sacrificial pond. It's an artificial pond. You can see it's, it's a good 80 feet across internally. Um, dug out completely uh, by man with a bank on the side we're standing on to retain the water. The excavation results show that they were using it for ritual purposes. What they found were the bones and skulls of uh, red deer and dogs, particularly large dogs, and um, the one skull of uh, a young male who had been very badly decapitated, taking the back of his head off. Why do you think people would do that sort of thing? The, the, the answers we get are a movement towards more extreme forms of religion and acts of propitiation. Um, because the climate's getting so bad, uh, we'd expect some sort of propitiation of um, a, a water god, a, an under, underground god. And this seems to be the best explanation for this pond. In the hope that he would stop the rains and the floods? Yes, exactly, yes. Bring back the good weather. At Flag Fen, the weather was similar. And, like Navan, it seems the site itself was a response to this. It was starting to get very wet, around about 1300 BC. And, and the reason for that is that the Ice Age ice caps were, were melting and the water levels in the North Sea were rising up. And if you could see your, your world, your countryside, your environment, slowly vanishing under water, you'd want to do something about it. I mean, you'd want to do a King Canute. I think that's what that is. It wouldn't actually keep water out. I think it's a gesture. The sort of gesture these oak posts represent has now been clarified by Pryor's most recent work. Everything points to a very special relationship here between water, sacrifice and death. To begin with, all the precious objects were deliberately broken. Out here, on the, the edge of the world, their world, if you like, um, people made offerings to the waters. And what is consistent about the humble objects and the high status objects when they were dropped in the water is that they were smashed, they were broken. So for example, um, a bronze brooch has got little dimples in it and those little dimples would originally have received coral inlay. But all the coral inlay has been smashed out. So if you like things were removed from circulation, from normal life, twice. They did it first by smashing and then by placing it in the water out of our world. What's more, these broken objects are arranged among the posts in a special way. To one side of the posts are the metal objects. On the wetter side, towards the ever encroaching sea, are the sacrificial bones of dogs. Death is just out here. So people are, if you like, emphasizing this boundary. And the other thing about boundaries is that you're not happy being at a boundary. You're always uncertain. And so people do things that make them secure in their own culture, in their own society. And that was why it was so important. And that was why it remained important for such a long time. I mean, Flagfen was basically in use as a religious centre for getting on to 1,200 years. So I think it's perfectly legitimate on those grounds alone to regard this as a very important religious place. seem utterly familiar, 
Almost everyone has visited one, and they seem to be timeless and unchanging, yet nothing could be further from the truth. So why do churches look the way they do? How do they develop, and how are they used? Archaeology can answer these questions. It shows us that churches changed because people's beliefs changed, their attitudes towards life, death, and religion. Excavations to uncover Saxon church sites, like this one at Flixborough in Humberside, show that they were originally very plain, one-room buildings. But out of this simplicity, the medieval church developed ever more complex rituals and built churches to match. Around 1000 AD, small chancels were added to accommodate the high altar. Later still, this was lengthened, and by the 1400s, other additions, like aisles, towers, and porches were widespread. But why did churches require such a complex array of different spaces? Churches were elaborate, principally because the glorifying of God and religion was absolutely central to people's lives and was tremendously important and vital part of life. And the ritual associated with church and the worship in church was tremendously elaborate. And they believed that terrible things would happen, that they would, they would go to hell if they didn't take part regularly in the life of the church. Here at Dennington Church, evidence survives for one of these rituals. This rare pyx canopy was used to store the sacrament, which represents the body of Christ, and was therefore so precious it was covered and permanently guarded. But all this would only be glimpsed by the congregation, because the chancel was separated from the nave by an elaborate rood screen. In the 13th century, chancels were lengthened, increasing the distance between the clergy and the people. Right down there, at the back of the church, where many of the poor and the women would have been, it would have been impossible to see the high altar. So for most people, there was no personal relationship to God. Salvation was through a priest. One must remember that the, the services were not conducted for the population. They were conducted for God, and it was important that God should see and the priest communicated with God, and it was actually not an essential part of the service that the, there should be any public participation in it at all. The congregation couldn't see through to the chancel. The only part of the mass they would have been able to observe would be the elevation of the host, the holiest part of the service, when the priest takes the host, which was literally Christ's body. It was believed that the doctrine of transubstantiation meant that the host was Christ's body and at the point of elevation it became so. And there were all sorts of superstitions connected with witnessing the sacrament. Um, the, the popular belief was it kept one healthy, but in, in effect what it, what it did, it, sa it saved people's souls and ensured them a place in heaven. These beliefs gave meaning to the different spaces in the church. The crucial concern with getting to heaven led to the development of private chapels in the aisles. In addition, these expressed your wealth and piety. On a daily basis, the priests who were employed um, would, s would come in here and would sing masses for the souls of these two and all their um, antecedents, their ancestors, uh, and other relatives, uh, those who uh, owed their, uh, as it were, their livelihood to these uh, great nobles as they became in the early 15th century. So what about the upper parts of the chapel? What's going on above our heads? Well, the chapel was all screened off by these splendid parklose screens. And along the top here, this would be used for processions and would take um, the priests, acolytes, um, along the top of the screen and across the rood screen, which would have run there in front of the chancel and would have had a crucifix uh, suspended above it. And the cross is the transition, as it were, between Christ's earthly life and his heavenly life and is also therefore used physically to divide the nave from chancel, heaven from earth. For the ordinary congregation, this symbolic division was emphasized as they stood and contemplated the cross. This effect was reinforced by images of the Last Judgment and Hell as a warning to sinners. But with the Reformation, beliefs changed, and the buildings changed with them. 
Here at Therning, there's evidence for this in the archaeology of the building. These fragments were once part of the medieval chancel, and this wall was built between the nave and the chancel in the chancel arch, which was blocked up and then a window was inserted. The chancel itself was demolished or allowed to fall into ruin because it was simply no longer required. After the Reformation, people kept their own counsel with God, and they did this through the Bible, the Word of God. Therning Church in Norfolk has a medieval fabric but a Protestant interior. The altar has been replaced by a communion table where once the chancel arch, rood screen and cross would have been. Here the centerpiece is an elaborate preaching pulpit placed to face and include the congregation. Even so, social differences among the faithful were still reflected in the layout. The medieval aisle, once a private chapel, was converted into family box pews, with the squire's pew being the largest and the closest to the vicar. In the centre, ordinary people sat on plain benches. On the south side, these hat pegs show where the men sat. The women sat separately to the north. Looking at this Protestant church, we can read its Catholic past in the archaeology of the building. That archaeology is a living record of the church in England and its changing beliefs. I don't know why I react to Stonehenge the way I do. I think it's a very fertile place where anything creative is fertile. And I think it, it, it gives me um, a higher sense of awareness. The past, present and future become one. And it's the same feeling I get when I look up at the stars and I feel t totally insignificant. But I also get an incredible sense of eternity, of always being here and always will be here. So I walk in here and there is literally a surge that I have no control of and I don't think that surge is anticipation. I just feel not only more in touch with the world, but I have better ideas, I feel refreshed. When I walk into the centre, my heart actually speeds up and that's a great kick, I really like it. And it's not that I think that it's the stones, I think it's the chosen place where the stones have been put that is important. What I find different about Stonehenge is it's remarkably small and it is very focused. Uh, it's a small area, even though it's got plenty of burial mounds surrounding it, 
but it is a small concentrated area. It just amazes me that these stones are so huge uh, and you've got modern, what I consider modern shapes, um, the little bumps at the top of the stones that, that kind of the top stone sits on. I mean, to me, that is such a modern shape. How, and how did they, they kind of mold these shapes? How did they bring the stones here? I mean, it's just a feat in itself. When Stonehenge was created, I like to imagine that there was a stronger sense of God. For me, the whole reason of Stonehenge was for human energy to focus and give back to the earth something that it takes out. So every time we plant, we grow, we harvest, there used to be a festival where we'd thank the earth. And I think that is the importance of Stonehenge, is giving something back to the earth that we've taken away. There's definitely a power in the land. It's a very fertile area. Uh, the, the, the shapes and the evidence of regeneration is just very strong here, um, of death and life and birth. It's so evident out here. If you'd like a copy of the viewer's guide which accompanies this program, please send a cheque or postal order for £2, payable to Channel 4, to Down to Earth, PO Box 4000, London, W3 6XJ.